This is on fruit tree grafting. You can graft many other kinds of plants, herbaceous tomatoes, resinous conifers, and so forth and so on, but this is just fruit tree grafting. It's the most straightforward and very commonly practiced. The reason we graft is because all very few fruit trees breed true to seed. You get most, you get most anything but what you started out with. Johnny Appleseed was huge and popular because of the booze he produced, not because of the table apples he produced. Most of his apples were what people call spitters. You take one bite and spit it out. But they make great booze. Strong flavored apples make wonderful apple jack, apple cider, and so forth and so on. But you have no idea what you're going to get in terms of a culinary or a, or a, or a um, dessert apple. Or in the same, it's the same with most with most fruits, most members of the rose family. So we graft in order to get exactly what we like. And out of all those hundreds of thousands of seeds that Johnny Appleseed planted, we came up with a tremendous number of extremely valuable fruit trees for purposes other than boo. And we have probably a great variety of uh, apple trees over here in North America because of our love of Applejack. And they have an original country where, where most of these fruit trees evolve. But, um, but as I said, if you plant a seed, you have, no, you have absolutely no idea what you're going to get. It, it, they usually revert back to a very sour, bitter, small, numerous fruit, hard to process, and not, uh, and not, that, um, not that desirable from most, from most human standpoints. So what we do is we take a, we take a twig, or known as scion, a twig from a tree that we know we like, and we put it on a tree of either unknown characteristics or of known characteristics, but those characteristics are not related to the quality of the fruit. The understock determines the healthy, the, built, the, vi the vigorousness of the tree, it determines the cold hardiness of the tree, it can determine and it determines the size, the ultimate size of the tree. It can have some small effect on the size and flavor of the fruit. It can have some small effect on disease resistance of, the, of what you add to it. There's, there's some debate about how much, how much crossover there is between the, between the fruit that you added to the understock and the understock, it, understock itself. Now, two kinds of grafting we'll be did, we'll be talking about here are, are bench grafting, so you start out with a, a known understock that you bought from somebody who probably, who probably cloned it. Some of them have grown by seeds. There are, there are some old Russian apples that we use, the Ananovica, which is bomb proof, but it takes it maybe five or ten years to come into bearing because it's so, so sure of getting itself well situated in the water, the water and the nutrient situation. Most of the understocks that the, to the trees you buy today size controlling and disease resisting and um, and they uh, they promote early fruiting primarily because it's a crummy rootstock and the poor damn tree thinks it's dying so it thinks it better get into the reproductive mode as soon as possible and the further north you go the less successful you are with these dwarfing rootstocks we generally don't go below semi-dwarf in Montana dwarf would be like 25 percent of normal size semi-dwarf would be like 50 percent Around 75%, you can call it semi-standard or semi-dwarf, whichever, whichever you want, and, uh, or super dwarf down around 25%. And, and uh, generally speaking, the, there is there is some there is something to do with the um, the vascular system that affects size, but it's primarily roots. So if you get an extremely dwarfing rootstock, you have a rootstock that does not withstand drought very well. It probably is fairly shallow, so it probably doesn't withstand. 30 degree below zero freeze like we get in October every once in a while around here. It's probably not going to, it's going to be a great little tree. It's going to pop out with fruit. You can buy it. It'll have fruit on it when it's in the flower pot. But, but you don't know how long it's going to last. But anyhow, you've got this control over it. That's, that's bench crafting. You buy these, you buy these little root stocks like I have, like I have right here. And they are, they are cloned. They're, they're produced by what's called stooling. They, um, they let them grow for a year or two, then they cut them down and, um, and keep sawdust around them as they, as they regrow, as they sprout. 
and then hopefully the roots will form. The roots will form around the around the base. These are little these are little pear root stocks. This was just a this was just a sprout coming up. Now something now actually this one actually this one I think was made with cuttings because all the roots come from one place. So this was probably a cutting inserted into the ground and the the, uh, the uh, growing situation was carefully controlled to make it uh, make it conducive to uh, to survival. And then we have here apple root stocks, and these I think are produced by stooling rather than by cutting. But anyhow, they they are produced. Uh, my favorite my favorite source is um, the Geneva root stocks. They come out of Cornell, which I think is probably one of the leading agricultural universities in the universe. And you can see little sickly roots coming out all along. And this just came up from a root crown right here, and um, and it, it's known to dwarf things down to about 50 percent full size. It's known to be highly resistant to um, to disease, and um, and it's known to handle zone four growing conditions, which is what we are. Even though we're warming up here, yeah, we think we can fudge and go to a lot more tender fruit than, than historically we've been able to do. Really, the vulnerable part, the vulnerable stage of a tree's life is on either side of deep dormancy. So we have these crazy early and late frosts, and it's almost worse than it used to be. Right now, because of the polar, the polar uh, air mass is heating more rapidly than the temperate air mass, and it's creating less of a less of a distinct boundary between the temperate air mass and the polar air mass, and so the jet stream is less constrained. It used to go like this, and now it goes like this. So we get more hot and more cold than we used to get in the off season. So you don't know. It's fun to gamble on these tender plants because one of the fun, some of the finest flavored fruit trees in the world have been developed in temperate zones of New York State, England, Germany, places like this. And usually they'll make it around here, but, but not always. Then, um, then top working is a different zone of grafting in which we take a tree that we already have and we add to it or change it over. You can do either one, any, any combination of the two. You can whack it completely off and start over with something entirely new or you can change it limb by limb. That's what I usually do on my place because I want, I want to try a large variety, try to test a large number of varieties in a small acreage. So I'll have 10 or 15 or 20 varieties on each, on each tree. And, uh, and that way you get the uh, you get a chance to see how it actually handles its climate. Plus, if you start out with fairly cold hardy trees, we're hopeful that some of the less less cold hardy varieties that we might want to experiment, we think they benefit slightly from association with tougher trees. At least they don't have to worry about the root and the stem freezing up on them. So you have that one little one little edge there. Now timing, timing is what really makes the difference in, in grafting. And now it's time to collect cyan wood. You want to collect cyan wood when it's completely dormant. Cyan wood is, a, is last year's growth. And if you guys will be careful, I'll pass this around so we can discuss some of them as, as we're going. But don't, there's a danger of getting your eyes poked out. <clears throat> what we want is last year's growth <clears throat> that, um, that is healthy. Ideally, it's about pencil size in diameter because that's so easy to work with. Smaller is delicate. Larger is uh, larger is, takes a little more strength and uh, and uh, and um, an effort to, to to make a nice clean make a nice clean joint. And um, so what we have here, the classic, this would be. Let me pass around a, a nice vigorous apple apple limb here. This is a Hudson's Golden Gem. Yeah, if you just, now I've, I've done some little arrows someplace, so you can see. You can, you can see by the color in the natural light, you can see where last year's growth starts. But there's also, there's a bud scale, the bud, the, the bud scale ring goes in completely around the twig at the, end of its, at the end of its growth. Like there's a bud right here at the tip, and it creates a ring completely around the point where this tip end bud was. All these buds over here make such small scars, we normally refer to the scar as a leaf scar rather than a bud scar. If you look around here, I've, I've made little yellow marks to show you where the uh, show you where last year's growth started. And so what you're doing is you're collecting twigs, 
that include only last year's growth, and that's important in terms of the wood you collect. It's not important in terms of the wood you're grafting onto. You can graft onto old wood. Old wood is attached to the root system. It has an edge. New wood is struggling. It's only surviving on what little nutrient and moisture can pass through the big wound you just created. So it's so more or less bottleneck. And everything's got to be just right for what you add to the tree. You can butcher the part that's still hooked to the roots unmercifully and it will survive. So you don't, you, don't have to, you don't have to graft onto new wood. You have to graft with new wood onto any wood. And, it, and, it, it, and instead, you can take a tree and whack it off with a chainsaw up to four inches in diameter and stick twigs in it in a particular way that we'll discuss a little later. And maybe it'll take off and go. Maybe not. But uh, anyhow, it can be a lot older than one year old. It's not going to be four inches in one year. And that's the general guideline the books will give you. Anything over four inches, don't try to graft onto it. It's too, it's too much for a long shot. But, but, um, and then within this, within this twig, the cyan wood, we want to collect the most hopeful part. And generally speaking, the, if you look at this, at the, base, at the base of last year's growth, the buds are very small. They're almost atrophied. They're only in reserve. All they've got is an idea of what they might do. And if the limb gets broken off, this twig is still attached to the whole root system and there's plenty of energy to bring these buds to maturity. But if you use these buds on a graph, they need so much energy to get going that they're probably going to fail before the wound that you created heals. So you don't want to collect the very bottom part of the twig and you don't want to collect the very end of the twig because it's immature. One of, them is, one of them is sort of dormant in reserve, only in case, it's only there in case the branch gets broken. The tree never plans for these buds to do anything. They're just kind of, there's nothing but a blueprint. You want the middle, the middle half or two thirds is what you want. That's your good vigorous, that's your good vigorous um, bud material. And buds is what it's all about. The bud is, the bud is what, uh, what fails, or fails or succeeds for you. So let me pass this around. This is just this is really vigorous. You can kind of see where the uh, start this on this side. Now this one. Now let me show you another one. Here's here's a decadent limb off of my off of this is an under limb. You can tell it's an under limb because the deer have been working on it. But here is a limb, another apple, and there's almost no grafting stock. There's almost nothing on it that can be used. <coughs> it's all fruiting spurs. And there's no vigorous young growth on it. The only hope would be this one little twig right here at the bottom, which is pretty spindly and pretty sorry bet. So pass this around. And this is, a, this is an old fruit producing tree. And if you have an old heirloom tree that you want to preserve, and most of the limbs are like that, it's a, usually a two year process. You've got to prune it strenuously to create new growth and grow it and, and, and reproduce it the following year. You just can't. You can't get it. This is all fruiting spurs, and there's nothing there that has much potential in terms of uh, in terms of creating a new limb or a new stem when you graft it onto something. How do you tell that it's a fruiting spur? Well, the fruiting spur is generally a little short limb, a little short, a little short limb that, that that doesn't doesn't have much chance of going anywhere. And generally speaking, you want to know how if you want to know how soon you'll get fruit from your if you graft a limb a new limb onto your old tree if you want to know when you'll get fruit. The earliest you're likely to get fruit is the third year out. The normal process is the first year you get vegetative growth. The energy goes into trying to get to the sunlight, trying to beat the neighbors to the sunlight. Plants are pretty, plants are pretty rough customers. You, will, you live or die. It's uh, kind of Republican. You, uh, you, get, you get to the front or you die. And, uh, so they zoom out there. And then the second year, some of the buds will form spurs. These are short side branches. And these spurs are what may in the third year, if everything is good, produce fruit. Most the palm fruit are like this. They, they, they the apples and pears. They produce fruit only on spurs with a few rare with a few rare exceptions. Then um, another thing you gotta watch out for is you don't want too many flower buds. You want you want vegetative buds. That would be buds that would produce either leaves. Or, or stems, and uh, that's a particular problem. Like with this apricot, you'll see it's just covered with little with little buds. You don't want to graft flower buds because what happens is all the energy goes into production of fruit, 
and you may get an apricot or two, but you'll never get a limb. You just might get one strange apricot a year for the next 20 years, but you'll never get a limb because all the energy got sucked up into the fruit production and it, it, it settled into being a spur instead of becoming an adventurous limb that's going to compete with all its neighbors to come out there and try to take over the world. And, uh, Here's cherry. Here's another example. You really got to look close at these cherries. Usually, usually they say the vegetative buds are pointed and the fruiting, flowering buds are rounded, but that doesn't hold true in any of these examples I brought in. If there's a lot of buds, it's flowers. You don't have five or ten limbs coming out from one point. So here's, here's a cherry. And you got really, to really come out to the end here and get to these buds out here, which are widely separated and large. If you start grafting down here with all these little clusters of cherry buds, if the, buds, if the graft survives, which is unlikely because fruits are such a drain and they don't pay back much, you know, it's just kind of a take it type deal, then you're not going to you're not going to have any success in creating a new a new variety on your on your tree. And uh, and this this is one year of growth. This is a vigorous old green gauge plum, so you can't tell, you know, you, and this, this would be what people would call a water spout. Most people call them a sucker, but technically a sucker comes up from the ground. A sucker comes up from the root. The, root, the branches that go straight up over the limbs are called water spouts, and it's advised that you don't use those if you want to add limbs to a tree because they're in such a strong vegetative competitive mode that they don't go into fruit production for an extra number of years, but if you're just creating a new tree, with a new rootstock, they're great because it's not going to produce any fruit for three or four years anyhow. And it's straight, clean wood, easy to work with, with space between the buds. And that space between the buds stores energy as well as giving the buds room to operate. So it's good. It's good for when you're, when you're bench crafting, when you're making a tree from scratch. These suckers are great. But if you want to add a limb to your, to your fruit library on an existing tree, these are not the best. These are not the best to graft with because they're just going to grow like a banshee for about three or four years and not think about fruit at all. They will eventually become a fruiting branch, and it usually happens when they bend over. What happens is buds all, buds all uh, exude a growth inhibitor. Anytime you have a bud uphill from a bud below it, it's going to inhibit the growth of that bud below it. It's going to inhibit the growth of spurs, it's going to inhibit the growth of limbs, it's just it's just fighting for the top. It's wanting to be the lead dog. And so usually the top, the top bud suppresses all the other buds. But when you finally get the branches, and sometimes if your tree won't fruit, you can bend the branches down. So the effect of gravity is less, is less pronounced. And sometimes, sometimes some spurs will be able to fight against this auxin, this growth inhibiting auxin that is being, being flowing downhill by gravity. And that's another reason when you're pruning, you don't want to knock off all your top buds. You want to keep you want to keep a few buds up high, or you'll just get a million water spouts the next year. You want something up there inhibiting all this water spout development. That's neither here nor there as far as grafting goes. Let's see, what else have I got here? This is that's the one that's already. That, that's the one that's already. So you, have you seen what the poor prospects this northern spire was for grafting material? It's just not there. Mm -hmm. If you were really good, maybe you could make it work. But if you were really good, you'd be too smart to try. <laughs> <laughs> Then here's pear. Pears are super vertical. They're another. They're one where you almost got to tie weights on the branches to get them to start bearing. They just, they just grow straight up all the time. But uh, here are these little side shoots. This would be, this would be the beginning of this year's twig right here. These are fruiting spurs that may produce fruit this year or not. And this is a high limb from my fingers right here, all the way to the top, is last year's growth. You can tell by color. Use this a lighter color. You can tell if you want to really be scientific about it, you can spot that ring around it created by the terminal bud, which stopped growing at that point last year. And, uh, and again, if you look at these, just, just to see how different varieties look, I'll pass this around too. Again, you want to stay away from the very bottom and the very top of, the, uh, of, the, of last year's growth. You want to use the middle third, half or two thirds and uh, and later on, what we do now is what, what I'm talking about here is whipping tongue graft. And let me pass some of these around. You cut it, you cut it at an angle, you split it two-thirds of the way from the end, 
slide them together, and then you have to wrap it. That's the that's the trick. As I pass some of these around, you see you see how they uh, see how they hold together, or don't hold together. If it's a well done draft, it will almost hold itself together. Now these are these are hopelessly dead. I don't graft in the middle of the day. I don't graft on windy days. I don't graft in a heated room. If your cadmium dries out before you seal, seal the air circulation away from it, then the graft will fail. But uh, yeah, let me just pass a few of these around. This is what you call the whip and tongue. It's physically, it's physically a strong joint, and it also it includes a lot of extra extra cambial contact. The cambial is a growing layer on the tree. It's that green layer. It lays down strong wood on the inside. It lays down soft nutrient um, conducting tissue on the outside, which eventually becomes bark. And, um, but uh, you've got the, the more cambial contact you have, the more likely you are for a, enough healing to take place to provide for the needs of the bud when it breaks loose. But the, the up your odds, what you do is you do everything in your power to keep your butt, to keep your sandwood as dormant as possible. You try to get it as early in the year as you can. Out in the Northwest, they start collecting sandwood in January. Here, usually February, early March is a good time. It's, it's recommended you don't collect your sandwood on very cold days. I don't know why, because I have dropped sandwood by mistake, left it out on the ground overnight when it got down to 20 degrees and how to graft in that science survive later on. But I've had a lot of grafts die, and that could have been, this could have been some up too. <laughs> so, but uh, try to get it on the day when the twig is not frozen, and then you try to keep it moist and as close to freezing as possible. Some people even say freeze it. Some people even say keep it around 28 to 30. But most people say 30, 34 to 38. Keep it in your refrigerator or keep it in a cold spot, but don't put it in a, in a refrigerator with fruits in it, with fruit in it, because fruits give off ethylene gas, and I don't know how, but ethylene gas interferes with the function of buds and sets them back. Although if you wrap it very carefully, you may you may defeat that. Thank you. Should people sigh on some moisture moist in the refrigerator? Not wet, but very moist. And if they get, and, and, and don't worry about, and, and you want to keep the air from circulating, but then you need to check them about every month, and if they start molding, then you need to, you need to uh, knock the mold back with a dip in Clorox solution, a 10% Clorox solution. That's actually a point five percent because Clorox is like 5% and you dilute it by a factor of 10. So don't, don't, don't go looking for 10% Clorox. It would take the skin off your hands if you could get it. But uh, just, so you dip them in that, and, uh, and you uh, and you then shake them, then you rinse them in a, in a non chloride solution and then wrap them back up. And I have kept them as late as June. And um, thank you, ma'am. Yeah, you just said it over there. I'll take it over there. But here's the way I keep my sandwich I keep them double bagged, and I keep them wrapped up in linen dish towels that I get at the Salvation Army. Because linen doesn't fold and rot as bad as cotton, but actually, most people recommend just using a paper towel. The reason I use cloth is because I'm constantly in and out from my bundles of cyanwood and the cloth invariably gets all flaked up and torn up and thrown away. But, but put a little paper towel in there and that's just fine. But I wrap it in this, in this material like this. I have, them, I have them tied in bundles and I pick the sorriest piece of that bundle and put the tag on it so I won't be using that. So the bundle will always be tagged. You know what you know what you're doing, and you take this with you. And when I go out to ground, I keep it in a cooler. And sometimes when I'm making production, I have I'll put them in a tray with water and have them sitting in the water. But anyhow, keep them keep them as close to dormant as you can keep them. And then when you buy these rootstocks, these rootstocks come to you dormant. They were dug last fall, but the sophisticated operators that make these rootstocks make a market. These rootstocks have ways of keeping them cold weather, and they're in good, they in dormant shape. But if they do start to uh, if they do start to show light, oh, it's not a tragedy. Watch out. As long as they are they're attached to some roots, they've got a chance. But if your scion starts showing light before the wound is healed, it's toast. It's not it's not going to make it. So you want to keep. So what what you do if you, if it's a uh, if you're top working outside, you wait until ideally you could start doing it right now. But 
Some books say, wait till all danger frost is passed. That means don't draft it by now. <laughs> so we ignore that. We ignore that counsel. But um, the guy that taught me thought February was the right time. But he lived at the base of Finley Point. That's a lot different from living out here in the middle, in the middle of, the, uh, of the valley where you never see snow on the fence poles <coughs> all the time and so forth. So, but ideally, for top working, you would wait until the tree just shows signs of life, just a tiny fraction of green showing between the bud scales. That's the day. And then do it in the morning and the evening when the wind's not blowing. The better you get, the worse conditions you can graft on. While you're struggling, graft when the wind is not a factor or the sunshine. Don't graft in bright sun, don't graft in wind. It's easy to avoid bright sunshine around. <laughs> you know, we're, we're blessed there. <laughs> but, uh, but then the ones, the ones that you bench graft, the ones that we do right here, let's see, here's one. I'll just do a. Uh, I'll do a harrow. And I use it, when I collect sandwood, I get a lot of different diameter because you don't know where a good location is going to be to graft on to it. The closer, the closer you can match the size of your sandwood, what you're grafting onto, the more candle contact you're going to have and the better things are going to go. In fact, sometimes I keep a set of calipers or you can make a little, a really good set of calipers is just take two pieces of wood and nail them together at a very tight joint like that and then write little increments on there and you just put it on there and you try to, you try to match up. The closer you come to a perfect match, the more chance of success you're gonna have. But anyhow, you make this, you make this match. Let's see, let's see, let me get, a, let me get one of these funky, um, funky rootstock. Now when you buy them, they give, they give you all the roots. And I used to dig big holes and try to get the roots, try to get the roots spread out just right. And I never succeeded. Always when I dug them up, the roots were all tangled up in a big mess. So now, I just prune the hell out of it. Because for one thing, you're, uh, you're, not, out of, you're not that much out of balance. You, you've already lost, they've already cut a foot off of it. I'm getting ready to cut another foot off of it. So it's not that much out of balance. It just loses some roots. And it's a lot easier. It's good to get, and generally speaking, when you, when you grab, if you get root stocks like this, Generally speaking, you, you treat it like a vegetable the first year. You put it in your vegetable garden. So you're going to be digging it back up. So you want the roots to, want the roots to start out in the right direction so that they're well distributed and well spread out. If you try to get all these long roots tucked in the hole just right, you've got to be a lot better than I am to make it work. They just get all tangled and contorted and they, they compete with each other. They girdle the tree and they do all sorts of nasty things. And, um, here, let's see, we'll take a, I'll just give you a demonstration here. I'll look through my, look through my cyan wood. Now, the bad thing about, um, about pear stuff is it's usually way too big. But here, I might come down here. I might get this one at about right here, a big point. Generally, you like to have the craft about 8, 12 inches above the ground. But that's, that's, not, that's not a huge deal. It's not a huge deal. So. And your cyan, if your cyan wood is, um, is too big, that's fatal. Your cyan wood cannot overlap anywhere. It's got to fall within the cut. Any piece that overlaps the cut on the bottom is going to die. And that's going to create an avenue for, for, uh, for disease. And then when you do the actual cut, everything is in relation with, within one hand. Generally speaking, I put a Band-Aid on my thumb first so I don't have to do it later. So I've got to bring in. And, uh, and uh, every book says, one clean cut. Bullshit. It never comes out one clean cut. The first cut gets rid of the mass of it, and then you try to make, then you try to make one clean cut. If you got it wavily, if you got a wavily cut, there's going to be no healing anywhere there's space not healing in a hurry. It'll be healing, but not when you want it, right when the bud's popping out. So you really want to get, and the longer, the longer the cut, the better. I say a one to four ratio is a minimum. Like if it's a quarter inch, it's a quarter inch twig, you need a one inch cut. And the, the reason I say the longer the better is because there's more cambial contact. And another thing that happens is, if you don't do a perfect job of cutting, it's flimsier and it's easier to squeeze it together. If you, shut a, if you do a little shortcut, it's, it's not go, you're not going to mash it together with any kind of wrapping material that, that's going to be readily available to you. So you make a fairly long cut, 
And of course, you keep a, they're always talking about polarity. That means top is top, bottom is bottom. Don't put the buds pointing down. And, uh, so you see my first cut, it's not the way it's supposed to be. Now I cut this a little too short and I've got one bud that's gonna get covered up. So I guess I'll just cut it off. Ideally, you have three, the normal, the normal number of buds on a scion when you do this grip and tongue graft is three. Some people go four, some people go one or two. But three is the normal, is a normal count. And you don't cut a wedge of wood out. The first, what discouraged me from ever attempting grafting on my own. And all the book illustrations always look like you cut a little wedge out here. Now, how are you gonna cut a little wedge out of something like that? I, it totally buffalo me. You don't cut anything out, you just split it. You go one, one third from the end or two thirds from the beginning. That way you get a one third overlap when you push them together. And generally speaking, the pith, if you go just beyond the pith, that's the little corky area in the middle there. If you go just beyond the pith, that's a pretty good guess as to where you should make your slit. And, and when you do it, you do not pull your two hands together. This is gonna take more than a band-aid if you're gonna do that. <laughs> you, you do everything with squeezing. You squeeze. You hold it like this and you squeeze and you rock because it takes far less force to do it when you're rocking than when you're just trying to yank it together. So you, you squeeze with this hand, you squeeze towards your thumb and you rock and you go about one, it's all thirds. Remember thirds, it's the magic number, go about a third down. You don't want to go way too far down because you want these two things to clinch each other. If you do a good job, you can take it like this and beat it around and mistreat it and it'll make it. And then if one side is too long, you cut that end off and you create a little church window. You go back. You don't let it over. you don't ever let bare wood overlap bark. There can be no joint form where bark is in the way. So instead of it, it cut it short, you create what you call a little church window sometimes. But right now, I came out pretty close. Not just exactly right, but pretty close. And then, and then I wrap it. And this is what I like to use. And this is for sale everywhere. It's for tying up tomatoes, but it's exactly the wrong stuff where they sell it everywhere. It's 150 feet, and that's too strong. You want to go box of rain carriers, it's the, you want 300 feet. You want three and a half mil, not seven mil. And this way, it stretches very nicely. And uh, it's not adhesive. Now I know people who do this with duck, with um, with um, with uh, black not, uh, with, with black tape, with regular electrical tape. And if you're a good electrician, you can get by with that. But I hate it because I can never wrap a wire just exactly right. I can never wrap a waterproof joint because it sticks to itself. This does not stick to itself. You start down below the joint, you grab it with your finger. And you go round and round and round, very tight, and it stretches. And you overlap by about half. And if you're good, when you get to the top, you tie it off and stop. I always come back down, just to make sure. I come back down to the bottom, wrapping around and around and around and around like this. And this stuff costs like four or five bucks a roll, and you'll waste your life trying to work with a short tail. Leave yourself plenty to throw away. Come around here. Do it like this, and then finish it off with some kind of adhesive, just so it can't slip loose. And um, what I use is this Falwell's tree heel or tree or grafting seal. It's, uh, it's supposed to be totally free of any noxious poisons and so forth and so on. You can get by with plain old asphalt. Elmer's glue will work, but you always coat the top right here because it will dry out. It will. It will it will evaporate water faster than it can make it through the, through the healing if you don't do that. And then put a little dab down here where you did that sorry little overhand knot. And this will lock it up and it can't come loose. And there you have, there you have a little bench crafted, a little bench crafted tree. And this I will keep in my basement at about 50 degrees till April or May when the soil is good to work. <clears throat> The school solution is to keep it at about 60 or 70 degrees for about 10 days so you get healing of the graft and then try to drop it down to 40 or 50. 
the rule of thumb is there's very little there's very little plant growth that takes place below 40 degrees. So if, if you keep it below 40 degrees, you've almost got it in the freezer. It's not doing anything. But sometimes if it, so what I do instead of going from 60 to 70 down to 40, I've got a basement that's 50. And I just put it down there, and that seems to work. It heals slowly, not as quickly as it should, but quickly enough, and the buds don't break. Use it. Unless, unless your bud was already starting to break when you put it down there. Then, then about the only solution is to, uh, they, they use what they call a heat tube. And you keep the plant in a cold environment, but you have a tube with warm water circulating through it that rests right against the ground. But this is getting pretty sophisticated. <laughs> I think we can get by without this. It's, uh, it's commercial grade, commercial grade work. Now, now this is this is the graph that goes on this time of year when the bark is not slipping. The term slipping is when trees start to grow, the cambium starts dividing. The tree, it's very easy to peel. And at that, at, that, at that point, later in the spring, there comes a wonderful opportunity to bark graft. You can slip, you can open the bark and slip a twig in there. Or you can split the bark in a T-shape and slide a bud in there. And these are excellent methods of propagation and they're not as dramatic and, uh, and, uh, and destructive as, uh, as my whipping tongue, which is pretty much all or nothing, you know, it's just little, you fail or everything dies, you know, but uh, I mean, you win or you do, if you succeed, everything dies, but, uh, and then lastly, when most of the commercial grafting is done, is in the late summer, and I find it particularly difficult here in Montana to succeed in this bud grafting because you've got to wait until the bud is mature, but you've got to craft soon enough that the wound heals. And sometimes that window is like 15 minutes, it seems like. <laughs> you know, we just don't. I, but in, in, in Oregon, they still, the commercial nurseries, they're grafting in July. Their test is if you take a twig, if you take a twig and, uh, and you bend it, bend it 180 degrees, if it breaks, it's ready. If it didn't break, it's not ready. They assume if the wood is hardened enough to be brittle, that the bud has probably come far, come far enough along. I don't know whether that's quite holds where our growing season is so much uh, so much abbreviated, but I think that's a good rule of thumb. And uh, but then you harvest the you harvest the bud, and you don't have these the cyan wood. You can store this. I have grafted cyan wood that I collected in February. I have grafted it in June. It was a crummy graft. It was like you missed a year, but it's like a head start for next year. You know, nothing happened this year, but if it lives, it may take off next year if you keep pruning everything around it so it's competitive. But normally speaking, if you graft in June, everything's going to grow around and it's just obliterated. It has no chance. You've got to be there nursing it all along. And then, then you've got a head start for next year if you make sure that it has a competitive, competitive slot with the light and the, and the nutrients and so forth. But um, the um, but. The bud stick, the, the, the bud stick is the cyan with the leaves still on it. That's a bud stick instead of a cyan. And you cut the you cut the leaf off, but you leave the petiole. That's the stem of the leaf. You leave the petiole, and that is your handhold. And there's a lot of hocus pocus. Don't ever touch the cut surface. And that may be why a lot of my grass fail, because whether I touch it or not, I still put the damn thing together. But um, you're not supposed to. So if you got that little petiole, you can hold on to that little petiole, and there's two ways you can. There's two ways you can do it. I've got this, um, <coughs> where did I put this thing? I got five, five pieces with all my visual aids here. But anyhow, you can cut it, you can chip bud, in which case you cut a chip, you come down here below the bud, you cut in an angle, say about 45 degrees. Again, wobbling and squeezing. Don't ever be pulling one hand towards the other. You're gonna, you're gonna be the emergency room friend if you do that. Never pull one hand towards the other. Always squeeze one hand towards, squeeze the, the fingers, the meat of the hand towards the thumb. And you're squeezing, you're not, you're not jerking, you're not pulling. And you pull off, pull off a little, a little chip like this. But now my hand's all over it because I got no petio to hold on to. And then you create an identical, as close to an identical wound as possible into what you're grafting onto. But it's not critical that they be identical. As long as you get a perfect junction at the very bottom, that is, the thickness of the wood in this chip 
is exactly the same as the depth of the cut and the stem. If that fits perfectly, if that cambium connects at the tip, and if, it's, if it's, the chip is too small, you go to one side. So you get like about, you get like about, uh, oh, 60% connection. And, uh, and, it's, and another thing, getting back to that with, uh, with these, uh, the grafting with cyan wood, if you can't match the sizes, there are two things you can do. One is you can pull the graft, the cyan, to one side. So you get as nearly as perfect a match on one side and the bottom as possible. And the other thing you can do, which is a little trickier, is you can, uh, let me see if I can find a big piece of something to do with it. We'll just take this guy right here. Instead of cutting all the way, instead of cutting all the way through in a full sloping cut, you can just do a funky little cut on the side like this. See what I've done there? And you can try to make that match the piece that you're going to, uh, this piece of cyan wood. Now the cyan wood, you do it just the way you would ordinarily do it. You do a full, a full length slope here. If I were good, I would be one smooth cut. But you see, I'm not. I have to come back and get it again. And if you if you can learn to twist your arm like this, you want this cut to be concave because it's easy to press where the where the thing is not going to fit together is at the ends. If the ends are splayed out, it's hell to pull them in. But if the middle is pooped out, you can crank it. You can really put the gizm on it in the middle. So try to have it. So there we get this thing like this now. And again, we come about a third of the way from one end, two thirds from the other end. All ends up. And we look at this and we see how I did. I didn't do worth a damn. So I'm gonna make this a little bigger. Start out small. It's easy to get bigger. You can't get smaller unless you start over. So I'm gonna come back. Come a little deeper. A little. Try to get, try to get, this is a hell of a deal to ask you to look at this distance, but I'm trying to get these two things to be something. You know, that's what I'm working on. And, and then you just come in here about a third of the way from the end. And, uh, and this is a little trickier. You got, and when you split the cyan wood, you want to go perfectly parallel to the twig. If you come in, you come in, then uh, then uh, let's see what happens if you come in. You get you tend to break things. If you go out, if you, if you get you get it too weak, you want to you want to split it. You want to split it right along its longitudinal axis. But here you can't do that. You won't get very far. You got to go in a little bit. You got to you got to force the thing in a little bit. It's just, other than that, the geometry is all the same. <coughs> I went a little too far. And then we have this thing like this. And that, That's and there's the church window. Then you got to do a really fine job of wrapping and downing. You can't have any. There can be no bare surface exposed to air. It's got to be. It's got to be insulated from any from any drying from any drying effect. So that's where you start using a greater quantity of this stuff right here. Or you can use that black asphalt tree heel stuff. The old traditional thing is wax, but it's just a terrible pain in the butt. It's expensive, and you've got to heat it over a double boiler. The guy that taught me had a $100,000 wood workshop, and he heated it without a double boiler, and I was a nervous wretch the whole time. We are always running back to see if the wood shop had burned down while we were reheating the wax, you know. But, um, now, another, another thing you can do, another favorite thing, you can wrap these things with rubber bands, but you can't use Staples rubber bands because they are not... They are not airtight. You've got to buy these special grafting rubbers. They're impregnated with wax. And they, and they, and they, it's easier to get a good tight joint with them, but I don't like them because I'm so ham-handed, I'm always banging into my grafts. And these aren't strong. <laughs> I like that, like that vinyl tape here. And so that's why I prefer it. You use the small ones like this for buds, and you use the larger ones for, for the whip and tongue graft. And, and the beauty of them is they will deteriorate on their own. And, uh, and you don't have to do any aftercare. With this stuff right here, you got to go out. I usually wait till late summer, just because I'm constantly, I've got everything planted too close together and I'm always banging into it. With this stuff, you can beat on it with a hammer and it, it's good to go. You know, it's, it's just, it's indestructible. Now, and now with, with the, uh, it's time for me to wind up. But anyhow, 
And so this is what I recommend. You can get it from Box of Rain, you can order it from Forest Suppliers, you can order it on the internet. But the thing to remember is all the rolls look exactly alike. You want the roll with 300 feet. That means it's twice as thin as the stuff that everybody else is using to tie up their tomato plants and everything else like that. I've never seen this for sale in anywhere that wasn't specializing in grafting activity except Box of Rain. So I went and begged it for stock. It's sort of expensive, but five or six bucks you can do 100 grafts. Not bad. <laughs> you know? And like I said, make it too long. If you're fiddling around trying to get that little tiny tail through there for the tail end, you're going to waste so much time. You could have gone and bought two more rolls out of it for the time you waste. So, Montero's a nice big piece. Now, with buds, everything is much more critical. Buds require light and air. So, when you wrap these buds, you use something entirely different. You use something that's not, not entirely impervious to air and water. And if you wrap the bud itself, you only wrap it with one layer. So it's, it's an entirely different thing. Take, we don't have to worry about the buds when we do whip and tongue grafting. The buds are way up here. We're working down here. It's no problem. And this cambium needs no, no light or sunshine. It's never had it before. It doesn't need it again now. You know, so with buds, everything is much more delicate. Budding, budding is much trickier, particularly in Montana where we have slow, when slow coming in to maturity and early getting frozen out by the early frost, but it's the preferred method of grafting by professional people. It does, it does a beautiful job. And of course, if you're using three buds per piece of cyan wood, if, you, if you've got five or six bucks in a piece of cyan wood or bud wood, then that's a little bit of an issue to, to get it to be a large scale hobby or something like that. But wrap, it very, wrap it very carefully, and, um, and I do recommend putting one layer over, over the bud. Back east, they frequently don't. But East has a different is a different world. The humidity is always 50% or more. Down here, we live in a fire climate. You know, things just dry out in a heartbeat. You've got you've got to you've got to reply a little a little Kentucky windish to everything you read about about agriculture compared to East and the West. We're we're a different world. Things dry out here. They we get these sudden freezes. It's just it's just a different deal. So. And, uh, and uh, there's a world of information on the internet. I think less than half of it is reliable. It's kind of like the Tower of Babel. We've got all this information and half of it is alternate. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so I recommend going, going to some of the good old tried and true books and, uh, and going to friends. And if any of you want any practical experience, I'm always looking for help. I've got a little place on Rose Crossing. I don't have anything to scribble my name and number up there. I don't know what I did with it, but anyhow. My name is Rod McKeever. I'm on Rose Crossing, halfway between the Helena Flat School and uh, and Highway Two, and I'm in the phone book. I'm a Luddite. Still got a landline. <laughs> spell spell M C capital I V E R, even though it's pronounced McKeever. So you're welcome to come and get practical experience helping me. It's a fascinating hobby. It's something something we all ought to do more of. It's something we can do as a community. <clears throat> instead of his competitors, it's a chance to be a citizen instead of a consumer. <coughs> and, uh, and right now, even though this is a harsh climate, I think I have over 200 varieties of, of fruiting trees and shrubs on my little three acres. And I'm adding 15 or 20 every year. I, I, I think the live to be a, to have 500. A lot of them are no good, but how do you find out? Some trees that are excellent in the climate, the flavor and everything else goes to hell in a different climate. Unless you grow it here, you don't know. Generally speaking, we're zone four. <laughs> you know, really, we're not. We don't zone four is every fifth year you get down to 30 below zero. But that's not the critical factor. The critical factor is these crazy early and late frosts, and we get them in spades. And that's what's going to determine what makes it, and what doesn't make it in your. Anybody got any questions? I'm running over time here. I have a volunteer crab apple tree. It's probably about 10 feet tall, tall very healthy. Could I graft eating apples onto the crab apple tree? It's possible. It's possible. I, I prefer, my favorite apple is what they call the apple crab. And it's a cross between a crab apple and a big apple. And it is almost certain to succeed. The, the, the further you get apart in relationship, the more difficult it may be in cavity. You don't know until you try. Now the stone fruits, a lot of times they use the same root stock for plums and apricots and nectarines and peaches. Stone fruits have a lot more compatibility designed into their into their um, vascular system. The uh, apples and pears, they say you can graft a pear to an apple or vice versa. If you're really good, 
and it might live 10 years, but it probably won't. So, and even out, even the highly advanced apples have trouble with a tough old crab apple. But an apple crab is generally speaking, it's a little apple like about a golf ball size, and they're my very favorite apples. They're just the right snack size. They're tough. They have interesting flavors. They're not sugar bombs like these things you buy at the grocery store, and they're tough. They can and they're adaptable. So I would try an apple crab, a Whitney, a chestnut, a, a Martha, a Centennial. I think you would have success with that. As far as an eating apple goes, I'd say the odds are less less hopeful. Any other, any other questions, comments? Uh, do you wrap the uh, skin when you, on a whip grab with the clear plastic to keep moisture in, or do you just leave it uh, there? Talking about the bud itself? Yeah. I, I recommend one. I recommend two or three layers around everything except the bud, which you crisscross. You wrap below it, you, you wrap above it, then you come back down and you wrap above it, and then you wrap below it, and then come back and put one little layer over the bud. Another thing you can do is you can put Vaseline on the bud, but I tried that and it killed them all. So I think you've got to use a very small amount of Vaseline. But I think I, I have achieved better success by just putting one single layer of this clear budding tape over there. And then I keep reading about power flitch. That's something you can use over burns or something. That's supposed to be excellent. It's supposed to deteriorate on its own and it's just you get a big patch and you just wrap it around one time and there's none of this careful, careful thread threading up, up and spiraling up and down and trying to get one layer over the bud. But remember the bud's an entirely different thing from the cambium. The cambium has no need for sunlight or air. The bud needs both. So when are you well, I'm starting bench grafting right now because I just got to order these things in and you can do it any old time, but I'm going to hold off on my top working until probably April, although who knows, in my town, I mean, if the sun starts shining and starts getting warm, the sooner the better because uh, the more heat, the more wind, the, the more critical it is for a quick healing of your graft and, and, uh, and the more accurate a graft has to be to, quick, to heal quickly. So, I would say April is the April is the best time to top work, and any time, any time if you've got a good place to store things like around a 50 degree, dark, quiet place, do a bench craft if you can get your hands on any of these. Root. The problem with root stocks is usually you usually have to buy them in bundles of 50 or 100, and uh, so that's why I'm doing things like this. I'm letting people know I exist. I buy and I like to keep trying new root stocks, but I don't want to try 50 of everything new. So I'm looking for people who are willing to buy rootstocks. They usually, usually if they're cloned, I, I forget, I'm bad on numbers. I might have two or three bucks in them with the shipping and everything and a single rootstock. If they're seeded, usually I've got about half of that in them. Seeding is just more, more economical and, uh, and um, no patents involved and stuff like that. And then getting, getting talking about patents, most modern fruit trees are, are patented. And the patent used to go for seven years, but now the Republicans are running things. Patents go on forever. So forget it if you're law-abiding. I'm not law-abiding. Uh, I graph whatever I damn well please. If you sell it, if you resell it, you're going to get in trouble. If you're graphing it for yourself, who's going to come look? And who knows what it is? <laughs> but it's not legal to, to create create trees out of patented plant material. If you're worried about legality, I'm not. <laughs> for the slip bark uh, budding, do you use dormant uh, buds that you stored up or growing buds for that? The, for the budding, you, I, theoretically, I could use these buds right now, but it's a two stage process. <coughs> First, it's got to heal, and then you've got to clip off the tree of bud. You know, what you usually do with bud grafting is you graft the bud in the late summer, early fall, usually late summer around here, and then you let it heal the whole winter long. Then in the spring you come along, and if you've got a good eye, you can tell whether or not the bud took. And then you cut off the tree of bud. And so, but that's so when you try to compress that into one growing season, things get crowded. It's not that groovy. And, and besides that, you're always getting your hands all over these damn cut surfaces, and that is not good. Anytime you're grafting and you drop something on the ground, you're supposed to throw it away. When you sharpen your knife, you're not supposed to use oil on your whetstone. Everything is supposed to be just. Plant material to plant material. Nothing else gets in between. No germs, no particles, no nothing. Any other questions? What species? If 
this fella behind you. Let oh, me get him think. first, and then I'll get you. What species have you had success with here? Just apples, or what, what have you grafted? Apples are my favorite because there's so many of them. There used to be, when the fella wrote the compendium of uh, apples going in New York, it was 6,000. Of course, it was by common name, so who knows how much overlap there was. But uh, apples are wonderful fruit for this area, but they are prone to, you cannot, you cannot grow apples without worrying about spray. Even if you're organic, you gotta spray. In fact, if you're organic, you gotta spray a hell of a lot more than if you aren't organic. Because the organic materials do not have the same persistence that the nasty stuff has. So apples are a problem. Pe pears are better. Thank you. Pears are better. They don't, they're not subject to as many diseases and they're very tough. And we can grow a few of the oriental pears, but not many. There are some oriental pears that we'll do here, but uh, my favorite pears are the Euro, um, Asian crosses, the gourmet, the summer crisp, the luscious. These are bomb proof developing South Dakota of all places. I mean, they grow in South Dakota. We we, we can skate here. You know? What was your question? Well, if you graft onto an existing tree, and if you do, do you cut the buds now or the sticks now and keep yes, the sooner the, the sooner the better. And then do it in the spring, then when they start to. When it warms up a little bit more, warms okay. up a little bit more. Well, and one more thing: when the, when all these buds pop out, you want to pick one dormant bud to be the to be the chief the chief guy. And you can you can program your tree. You can point the bud where you want the limb to go. But the limb is going to start out where the bud's pointed. It adds an extra layer of complexity. But if you've got a little hole in your tree, you want to aim it so your end bud is headed for that hole. And then most people used to say, just rub off the competing buds once you've seen that you've got a winner. But what I do is, I figure that all those buds are contributing to the growth and healing of the, of the wound, and so I just tip the buds that I don't want to achieve dormancy. I just pinch off the tip, so they're still producing, but they're not competitive. They've lost their, they've lost their lead, so to speak. But that's, uh, and when you got a single bud, it's all or nothing. But with the swift and tongue grafting, usually people go with three buds, and that is to give, a, give yourself a little margin of safety. But also, I think by pinching off, pinching off the, usually the two lower buds that are not going to win the game. And, but just pinch off the end, the end third or so, or so, and leave them there. Then the next year, get rid of them mainly. But they're all to the good for the first year, because you're trying to, you're trying to <laughs> recover a plant from a pretty serious abuse. <laughs> it's pretty harsh, this graft. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, I'd be interested in suggestions how we can make this work better. I know I could come up with better visual aids and stuff, but I hope I hope it's uh, I hope it's gotten the point across. Now is the time. Collect your cyan wood now. You can start grafting any time. But I would suggest if you don't have a lot of grafting to do, wait till April. And do it early in the day and late in the day. Don't do it when the sun and the wind are a big factor. It gives you more time to uh, play around with it. And the books generally say don't put the cyan wood in your mouth. Although it seems like it would help, but they're just worried about the time. But some people do keep a little bucket of water when they when they um, when they carve the cyan wood they put it in there. But what I do is I carve the tree first, because I figure it's the toughest. And then I try to cut that cyan wood and pop it on there right now. In a hurry. Don't touch it. Don't let anything else touch it. And wrap it firmly, and, uh, and always start your wrap, of course, from the bottom, from the solid part. Start, you can hold on to that solid part, you can get really, really get a good tight grip on there. With the rubber bands, you're supposed to not stretch them any further than half their thickness. It goes from a quarter of an inch to an eighth of an inch, that's as far as you're supposed to stretch. And the rubber bands are good, they're easy to work with, they're easy to work with with this, but like I said, if you're ham handed, if you've got dogs and children running all over stuff all the time, then. Uh, this is it, right here. <laughs> okay, thank you.